one, thank you very much for the invitation. Two, I have found a new appreciation about what it entails to start a new journal. So to the whole editorial team of Methods in Ecology and Evolution, you, you should be very proud of yourself. You've done a fantastic job, it's a great journal, and it can't work without the dedication, motivation, and hard work of this editorial team. So well done, and a happy birthday. And then uh, the third stuff, if anything goes wrong, it's all Rob's fault. <laughs> <laughs> so Rob, you will have to leave with that responsibility <laughs> for the coming uh, hours. Okay, so I'm going to talk about satellites, which weren't flagged by uh, Bill as potential new stuff. I'm going to demonstrate, hopefully convince you that it's part of the game. Um, I'll quickly set the context. I'm a conservation biologist, so I'm really interested in uh, trying to curtail the loss of biodiversity. So traditionally, what's going on, you have uh, observed rapid change in environmental conditions, which are leading to unprecedented level of biodiversity loss reported by various institutions and through uh, captured by different metrics. And that may or may not, but it looks like it does, have some implication for ecosystem uh, services delivery and altogether human well-being, which is all of us. Uh, so it's a completely uh, self-centered interest, really. <laughs> Um, my research framework, I uh, generally like to uh, fit what I do within the, uh, the framework uh, up, um, that the CBD used, the Convention on, Bi on Biological Diversity, which is the pressure state response. So looking how um, uh, pressure such as climate change, land conversion invasive or over exploitation affect the state of the environment. Uh, in terms of structural attribute, functional attribute, or compositional attribute, and how different type of responses, whether it's about setting protected area, uh, informing a future uh, planning for land development, or thinking about vaccination, can or cannot contribute to uh, improving the situation. And so that, and I do that uh, uh, mostly uh, while using satellite data. And if you want to have a look at the type of thing that we do, we, we had a nice uh, field trunks issue last year that, that is uh, presented using that kind of framework. Why, why satellites? Uh, there's a lot of reason why it's a cool tool for any ecologist. First, it provides you with world coverage. It's substantially cheaper than having a bunch of people going around with binoculars or, or any kind of method to try to get the same information at the same temporal and spatial resolution and at the same temporal and spatial extent. Um, it's reproducible, uh, it's sustainable, it's checkable. You can download the data, redo the data analysis and really see whether um, that holds or not, so transparent and standardized. And also, um, there's more and more evidence over the past decades that you can directly link it to uh, uh, the ecology of the species. Um, so making it relevant to behavioral ecology, population dynamic, macroecology, etc., etc., movement ecology. So not, if you have never been uh, faced with satellites, the first thing to know is that not all satellites are the same. You get the one that are called passive and the one that called active. Passive, it basically works like a big camera. So it's a sensor on board the satellite that takes pictures like your camera would do it. So it uses uh, the sunlight that has been reflected by the Earth and take inform information on that. It can do it in two different ways, basically. It can either do it through broadband, so what's being reflected in the blue, in the red, in the green band. And so that would be multispectral, multi so wide band where the information is captured. Or it does it through a lot of very tiny, narrow uh, band, very clustered together, and that's called hyperspectral. On the other end of the spectrum, you have something called active sensor. So active sensor means that the sensor sends a beam of, uh, beam of energy and then capture what comes back can either send something like microwave, and that's what's called radar, or it can send something like laser, which is called le uh, LIDAR. And all of that represents the, the broad uh, differences in satellite, irrespective of the fact that those sensors can capture information at different temporal scale or spatial scale. When, when looking at those type of satellite in particular. So the one that are optical, using the information from the sun, and uh, with very broadband. You can actually combine the information capturing the red, blue, green, 
uh, to form uh, indices, some of them being directly relevant to monitoring vegetation. Uh, and one of the vegetation index that uh, has been really successful in ecology is the normalized difference vegetation index. So uh, here is a, a quick drawing that uh, aims to illustrate how the NDVI works. So imagine this, this tree, healthy tree, doing well, uh, being green, producing a lot of primary productivity, etc., etc. A healthy tree does do stuff. It uh, absorbs the visible light, especially in the red, to, uh, to foster um, photosynthesis. So a lot of the red light that comes from the sun is being absorbed by that tree, which means that very little goes back to space. And then uh, it, a healthy tree also reflect near infrared, and that's because uh, the heat uh, that is associated with the near infrared could denature the protein. So a healthy tree uh, reflects a lot of the near infrared uh, um, wavelength. If you compare that to a tree that uh, is senescent, about to, to die in autumn or whatever, it does uh, those things relatively badly. It absorbs less visible light because there's less uh, photosynthesis going on, less chloroplast. And then uh, it reflects less well the near infrared. So if I combine this information in the near infrared and red using this normalized difference vegetation index formula, which is the difference between the near infrared and the red, divided by uh, the sum of the near infrared and red, you can see that something like here will have an NDVI of around 0.72, while this one will be substantially smaller. So basically the NDVI uh, vary between minus one and one. The higher the value, uh, the more primary productivity. And uh, it, it, that's product placement, if ever. I wrote a whole book on this, so uh, there's much more detail if ever you want to know more about this. So I'm going to present uh, some of the stuff that we have been doing uh, recently uh, within the context of this pressure state response framework. So the first stuff is uh, what have we done recently in terms of pressure and how can satellite help monitor pressure in a conservation uh, uh, setting. So one of the things we did some years ago uh, was to look at this situation. So um, the Saharan biodiversity animals in deserts are generally not doing that great. Uh, deserts tend to be completely overlooked by conservationists. There's not that much funds going into it, which means that there's a biodiversity crisis over there. There's very few hotspots of biodiversity still left in the Sahara. One of them is in the uh, previously known Adak Sanctuary in Niger. Now, Niger has been uh, uh, switching uh, its way of making money. And one of the things that uh, Niger is interested is into developing uh, the oil industry. For that, it has been selling a lot of its land uh, to uh, oil industry for oil exploration. That type of uh, uh, expansion and new direction in the industry is not really well informed from a conservation point of view. But what we know is that a lot of the lands have been sold just nearby that, that important protected area. So the question was, is there really an impact? How, uh, how much activity is it, is it going on? Can we detect it? Now, you can imagine that working in Niger, in Sahara, is not an easy thing. Not only is it logistically difficult, but it's also politically. And, and uh, safe, there, there are some quite strong safety issues. So monitoring huge extent of land but with, your, with your car, trying to search for oil activity, uh, uh, evidence is, is, is simply close to impossible. So what we were trying to do is to try to see whether we could detect oil activity using satellite data. As many sciences, but particularly true in conservation, there's not that much money. So we were trying to do this using free data. One of the good source of free satellite data is Landsat, which is what we were using here. So what we did was to use a GPS point of oil activity uh, whether it was uh, people starting to search in the ground or, uh, or um, literally um, infrastructure in place, uh, having the GPS of that and then train the method to try to see whether you could detect it with Landsat. We did that in a site in Algeria where it's much more easy to see those oil activity infrastructure and then exported the method once developed to Niger. We were able to uh, not only find the one we knew were existing in um, in Niger, but also uh, discover three new 
uh, exploration site. Um, there was quite some uh, omission rate, 43%, mainly due to uh, a spatial scale issue. Sometimes uh, the disturbance are quite small and can't be captured by something like Landsat, which has a resolution of 30 meters. Um, so we are trying to refine the method using some of those active sensors, namely radar, but that gives you an idea about uh, how such a method, which completely relies on free data and, and free software, can be implemented for the whole of the Sahara to start to map those, uh, those threats that we have simply no idea about. Another uh, type of threat, and, and there is a, a threat I tend to, uh, to talk about deserts in that section, um, is uh, the artificial water point. So this is another reserve, it's, it's in Chad. Uh, it's called or, or Wadi Rime Wadi Hashim. And this reserve is famous because up until the 80s, um, there was uh, the last population of scimitar oryx, the big ungulate typical of the Sahara. That species went extinct in the 80s, and that was one of its strongholds. Now, the, the species has persisted in zoos all over the world, and there are um, plans to try to bring it back to Chad. Um, the Chad government is really interested in doing this, and there's some nice leverage for doing so. Now, the question is, is it safe to, uh, to reintroduce a bunch of individuals in this place? Is it still able to hold a viable population of scimitarics? So we were looking at different threats or different uh, angles of the ecology of the whole ecosystem to see how, how fits how fit uh, it is. And one of the things we were looking at are uh, artificial water points. Now, the Sahara over the past 30 years has been really changing in terms of dynamics. Does, uh, you, you had those big drought and then you get that green wave coming up, which means that uh, uh, in this place, which sits just at the transition between true desert and sub-Sahara, uh, you get much, much more uh, livestock um, activity, especially in the south. Now, um, to try to, s to, to provide some safe ground for this livestock, one thing that is quite attractive is to get those uh, artificial water points because it provides water to your livestock. So there has been more and more of those artificial water points being uh, appearing in the source of the reserves. And again, we have no idea where they are, how many they are. Uh, th it's an expansion that is uh, uh, n not reported on and uh, where we don't have any idea about the actual impact on the ecosystem. What we know, however, uh, is uh, that on, on small ecological uh, studies, it has been shown that it promotes degradation. It enhances uh, conflict between wildlife and livestock. So it does have some impact and sometimes neg uh, negative to the native fauna. So what we were looking at is whether we can detect those artificial water points, and here is a picture as to how it looks on Google Earth, I think, and try to see again whether we can detect it with Landsat. Why Landsat? Again, the same story, we were going for free data. Uh, and so we developed a whole method using uh, free, very high resolution data to uh, train uh, a, fo a random forest to try to detect those artificial water points in this reserve. And uh, it was pretty good. Altogether, we identified 151 points uh, going basically through the world reserve with the very high resolution data freely available through Google and Bing. Uh, and then uh, the method we developed from Landsat detected pr uh, roughly uh, half of it. Again, the same issue as uh, those points become relatively small scale, Landsat struggling to uh, detect it. But it allowed us to really map where it was and uh, where the pressure were, which informed directly some of the plan for this reintroduction. Uh, finally, uh, something about climate change. Uh, so here we change and go from one um, uh, not so uh, studied ecosystem to another one, uh, which is mangroves. So that was a work we did on the Sunderbans, uh, which is the biggest mangrove in the world, um, which sits directly between uh, India and Bangladesh. So being a famous UNESCO site, you would think that a lot is known about that ecosystem. You'd be very wrong. Um, uh, when we started to look at it, uh, a bunch uh, of its uh, ecology and uh, reaction to environmental change right now is not really known. So it all started by looking at uh, wanting to quantify the impact of a storm uh, that hit uh, the, the Sunderbans uh, in 2000 
and seven, I think. And uh, looking at uh, degradation. And one aspect of the degradation that we were looking at was coastal retreat, uh, which is uh, uh, the change in the, coast, in the delimitation of the coast within the Sundarbans. And what we were able to show completely independently of this assessment of storm is that within two years, you had up to 170 meters of coast loss. And that directly attributing, uh, that, that can be attributed to environmental change, particularly sea rise. So radar, interesting methodology when you work in a situation like this, where there's loads of clouds, because one of the, the key aspects of radar is that it can go through clouds, it capture information. If you think about those optical passive sensors that I was telling you about, if it works like a camera, well, if it, there's a cloud, it's just going to take a picture of the cloud. So uh, having radar means that you can go through it and actually capture the information under the cloud. And finally, something about long conversion. So and this is an example that I like, even though the figure is pretty bad. <laughs> um, it was a collaboration started some years ago with a colleague that was working in the Solomon Island. Now, Solomon Island, biodiversity hotspot, especially in terms of birds, uh, but nearly nothing known over there. Um, cloud coverage, around 80 to 90 percent. So most, uh, most uh, uh, experts in remote sensing would tell you that optical, uh, passive, a uh, sensor would not be a good idea for monitoring something like deforestation or land use conversion in those islands. The thing is, there's not much radar data. Very high resolution is, is all uh, either uh, not available or, or, or not at the providing you with that time series to try to see whether there has been changes. So what we did was actually to consider those uh, passive sensors uh, and looking for a change in primary productivity using um, a satellite, a bunch of satellites called MODIS, which provide you with information on primary productivity at 250 up to uh, 250 meter up to a kilometer. And what's interesting with MODIS is that capture information every day and the data are aggregated over a 15 days period. So even though there's a lot of cloud cover, you can still capture a significant trend uh, if there is one. And we did capture, so and uh, what was interesting is that you can't see in this bad figure, but you'll have to trust me on this, a lot of the deforestation was actually happening just nearby where the community were. So it was the first time that we were able to report uh, a significant changes in that part of the world and bring some conservation attention uh, to this island in particular. Now, um, monitoring uh, the state of biodiversity, I'm going to talk to you about mostly about the NDVI work um, for any ecologist interested in what shape uh, distribution, uh, abundance, or simply uh, life histories and uh, performance index. So the first time I ever worked with NDVI was just after my PhD. I spent my PhD looking at all the plants and doing one, one plot after another. I did 600 of them in one month. I was exhausted. <laughs> and so I started my postdoc in Norway and I uh, remember uh, basically, they were interested in the same kind of way, and I couldn't see myself doing the whole of Norway with all those plots. <laughs> so rapidly, we started to discuss about uh, satellite, and at that point, I had no idea about satellite data. Um, all I knew was uh, that you could use it for climate stuff, and that's, that was about it. Um, so um, the Norwegian situation was interesting because uh, they had a red deer population in the west of the country that started to expand in the 60s and 70s, and they really wanted to understand why or why it's expanding. And one of the main uh, hypotheses was climate change. Um, uh, so Atla Mr. Rudd, with who I was working at that time, had this idea that it all depends about the type of winter that you have. So if it's a very cold winter, uh, whether uh, you are at, at low altitude or a high uh, altitude, you have the same amount of snow which means that when spring start, uh, it's, it starts roughly at the same time between uh, low altitude and a high uh, altitude. And why does it matter? It matters because the red deer spend their winter in uh, those low lands. And as the spring comes, they go higher up. Uh, now, a second type of winter that you can have in Norway is those uh, wet and not so cold. When, the, when it's that type of condition, uh, snow doesn't settle on low land, but it accumulates a lot 
uh, at high uh, altitude. What it means is that you have a really huge spatial disconnection between the onset of vegetation at the low and the high altitude. And that's quite good for red deer because it means that uh, it can basically get uh, the new vegetation, the newly uh, appeared uh, leaves all, uh, all up during its migration from high to uh, low to high, which means that it benefits a lot from the spring. Um, and what we showed was that you can get up to five kilogram differences between those, type two, those two type of winter and those two type of spring, uh, uh, depending, uh, uh, depending on the uh, climate condition in winter. All that short, what we showed is that there is a correlation between when vegetation start here and when the deer start to migrate, and that influence directly uh, their body mass and therefore their performances in terms of uh, survival of the young or age at first reproduction. So a neat way to be able to dissociate the direct and indirect effect of climate on animal performance. Um, another thing that uh, you can play with is that you can really test some theory, macroecological theory, about the role of energy in explaining animal distribution and abundance. And that's what we did uh, in a, a study case for uh, Africa, where we looked at uh, the abundance of uh, 13 different species in 77 national parks, and this across 23 countries. And what we showed was that there's a relatively good relationship between uh, primary productivity as indexed by this NDVI and uh, the abundance of uh, antelope. What I thought was quite interesting is to, to look at the individual response of species. You could really see that some of the big grazers like the whale beast and uh, the buffalo, you had a neat positive relation. But some of the uh, more competitively challenged uh, such as uh, the name evades me right now. <laughs> but some of the, the, the less competitive species, uh, the, the relationship wasn't so straightforward. One of the things that you can do is to really look at the drivers of uh, survival, reproduction, body mass uh, at the population level. So admittedly, this is relatively... Uh, this is a relatively small set of examples where you can do that because you need the long-term data to be able to explore this. But that was one of the uh, situations where there's a roe deer population in France, in Chizé, that has been monitored for over 25 years. Every winter, everybody gets out in the reserve, capture roe deer, weight them. And then what we were doing was to see whether there, was, there were some key period within the development of those roe deer when they're young. Uh, that matters the most for understanding their long-term performance. So what we did here was to uh, look at the correlation between the NDVI around the birth and up until uh, six months of age or so, and uh, the body mass at seven or eight months, which is when they are captured and weighed. And what we were able to show was that for that reserve in particular, the condition just around birth, so the, the first few weeks of life, are really important to uh, define what kind of individual you'll be, define your body mass, that in itself influence survival and future performances. So understanding this, this kind of cohort effect, but in a, in a temporal frame and understanding how uh, vegetation play its role was one of the contribution of this uh, study. Interestingly, it didn't work everywhere. We tried to replicate exactly the same in another roe deer population, but much more up north in France. And over there, it didn't work for a simple reason, uh, canopy cover. So roe deer doesn't really eat on top of the trees. They are under the top of the tree. Imagine your camera seeing from space is covered, obscured by this canopy. So you couldn't really pick up the signal of what was going on when it comes to roe deer food. Finally, responses. So two examples, coming back to this uh, Chadian reserve and uh, the reintroduction of the scimitar oryx. Um, as said, this species is uh, is a specialist of those transition zones between true desert and um, Sahel. So likes its, its access to vegetation, but not to green and not to desertic either. Um, so really living at that, at that contrast. So what we looked at was how that uh, transition zone has been evolving since the 80s, since its disappearance, basically. So we used, again, this NDVI. So there's two uh, figures here. This one looked at uh, the 
the temporal trend in uh, annual primary productivity for each pixel within that reserve. The green are positive, those ones are negative, significant, significant, non-significant. What it tells you is that over the past 30 years, in that reserve, the north has become much more desertic, while the south has become much more green. This is an, a figure that looks at the level of seasonality within a year. So how much difference is it between the lowest point and the highest point in primary productivity in a given year? Again, this is positive and significant. This is negative and significant. So basically, the level of seasonality has increased in the south, which has become greener. What it means is that the transition zone between those green pastures and the true desert has been narrowing. Again, which could be a, a concern when you're thinking of planning uh, a reintroduction. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, it just means you need to be aware of it uh, in terms of different threats that could affect the system. Remembering also that not only is it getting greener here, but you get all those uh, artificial water points being built. Another and last example uh, was about protected area management. Um, so one of the things that NDVI allows you to do, especially given that we have over 30 years of data available, is to look at how things have been changing in time. Uh, so you can always plug data that have been collecting in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, and re-explore them using those kind of information. So there was some debate as to whether climate change had some impact on uh, the vegetation dynamics in Africa, or whether most of the, were, most of the changes were actually due to human influences. So what we did was to look at the primary, primary productivity dynamics over the past 30 years in 168 protected areas of class one and two. Class one and two being the, the one that are the most uh, protected, at least theoretically. And then uh, we looked at the trends in NDVI uh, in those 168 um, uh, sites. And what we found was that the trend we reported, where it was uh, significant, were actually matching the IPCC um, expectation, which is increased seasonality uh, in those in the east and south part of Africa and reduce uh, annual primary productivity uh, in those uh, uh, in the same part too, but in those uh, much more in the less in the south south. So interesting to, to see how uh, you could capture some direct influence matching what was expecting from uh, prediction on uh, uh, patterns of uh, change in temperature and precipitation for Africa. Again, just a way to demonstrate that is something to think about when you are uh, looking at the different threats uh, to protected area management. There's much more. Uh, I just focused on some of the stuff that we did. Um, in a recent review that we published, uh, last year in Journal of Applied Ecology, we had a look at what you can actually do uh, using satellite uh, remote sensing, and it goes from uh, detecting invasive to air quality assessment uh, to uh, trying to uh, inform fire uh, management. Uh, so, so much more than just what has been shown here. So to conclude, I hope that uh, I've uh, managed to convince you that uh, satellite is part of the game in ecology. It provides a fantastic opportunity to uh, inform uh, you about how is your habitat doing, where is it, whether it's habitat distribution, habitat degradation, land use change, or habitat fragmentation. Uh, it also can allow you to get direct, direct information about uh, the functionality of your ecosystem, whether uh, we're talking about phenological change, uh, the, the, the change in the threat faced by an ecosystem such as fire. And also, um, it provides you with information that can be directly plugged with your underground uh, measure uh, um, or uh, metrics of biodiversity. Um, but not only that, but it can also inform uh, behavioral ecology, life history trade, macroecology, movement ecology, etc., etc. Um, there's even more uh, opportunity coming up. Uh, as we talk, uh, the Sentinels uh, should be launched soon, which should provide increased uh, temporal resolution on data that will be comparable to Landsat, but also on some of the radar data. Um, there used to be a LiDAR sensor on board the satellite, which was called GLASS. It broke very quickly, which means that we never really 
uh, had the opportunity to uh, play with the LiDAR data in ecology. Um, this is going to be fixed as uh, ISAT 2 is forecasted to be launched in 2017. LiDAR is an incredible, po powerful way to look at 3D structure of your forest or your ecosystem and see how that affects biodiversity distribution. It's also a key element of any carbon or uh, uh, carbon related measure or forest monitoring opportunity. Um, one of the limitations and consideration is definitely to understand which sensor and which resolution. Well, uh, so you know, I want to play with it, but how do I choose the satellite and the sensor? Uh, my answer to this is, is always the same. First, think about your question. Then you are, when you have your question straight, then look at what kind of uh, product is available. Yes, it's not the same as being in your garden looking at your aphid, for sure. And it will never give you the same uh, uh, information as you doing it on the ground. But there's a lot of situations where you simply can't do it. So it's, imp it's important to capitalize on those opportunities where it really matters. Um, there is currently a trade-off between a spatial and temporal resolution. If you want to have high temporal resolution, generally you will have low spatial resolution. Basically, if you're on, if you're on very high resolution spatial data, like Google Earth type of, type of images, you are not going to have that every week or every day. You're going, if you're lucky, it's, it's one every month, every year. It's, it's much more delay between images. Uh, if you, uh, but if you are prepared to lose some of the spatial resolution, then you can really have some nice temporal resolution up to the week or the 15 days. Uh, the usefulness of what you are using uh, might be a, a function of the scale. It all depends about your question at the end of it. And sometimes the resolution will not be so informative the, given the question, the model, uh, and the location that you're considering. For example, if you're working in the tropics with 90% cloud coverage, optical uh, sensors are not going to be that great, except if you're looking for really broad patterns. Um, all of this is uh, about consisti consistency and commitment um, to ensure that those things remain. So one of the big threats sometimes is that you have a very valuable thing that exists. Nobody really realized how valuable it is until it disappeared. Landsat broke uh, some years ago and uh, half of the data, a lot of the data that it was collecting wasn't actually usable. And no one really realized how Landsat was important until this broke and there was no further mission plan. And it took up until last year so that Landsat again uh, uh, was functional with a new Landsat 8. So it's important, to, it's important to explore new way of doing things, but before doing that, try, try to make sure that things that work and are informative stay in place. Um, I will never argue that uh, satellite remote sensing is a replacement to uh, ground-based data. I will argue, however, that it's strongly complementary. And uh, the best result is when you combine both types of data so that you can uh, predict, extend, uh, inform in some location where it's difficult, but at the same time uh, do it in, uh, in uh, as accurately as possible, let's say. Um, the remote sensing is uh, mostly used nowadays by geographers. Uh, we are just starting to grasp how to use satellite remote sensing data in ecology. So to really uh, trigger more good work, we'll need better collaboration between those sometimes disjoint community. And, to, and so that we, don't, we make sure that money is not wasted. And there are several initiatives to, to do that kind of thing. Uh, CEOs, which is the Committee on Earth Observation Satellite Biodiversity Task is one. Geobon is one. Animove that try to put together different background uh, in training session is another one. Uh, and in general, capacity building is really key uh, so, that, so that we capitalize correctly on that potential. Um, and then finally, final point will be that data cost is still an issue, so a lot of satellite data are free. Some of them are not free, and uh, we published recently a, a paper on accessibility and uh, the importance of making those data free, especially to the biodiversity community. And to illustrate that, this is the use of Landsat. This is when it started to become free. Uh, so a huge, uh, a huge impact uh, of just releasing those data to the right community. Thank you.
a really interesting talk. Um, as we change over, we've got time for just one quick question, if anyone's got one. People are talking about these nanosatellites, these yeah. things the size of a shoebox, 10 kilograms or whatever. Are they yeah. going to revolutionise the world? Oh, you know, it, it, with every press release, you have a new revolution. <laughs> the thing is, they will never give you the... They, they are trying to, to build the space between the drones and the, and the Landsat type of data or Google type of data. But they, they are not, to my knowledge, most of them will not cover the whole globe. And they will not provide you with uh, a temporal extent and are not going back in the 80s. And they, the, we still don't know what they will come up with. It's an interesting technological development and so are all the opportunity. But, uh, there are things that exist that are really working. So for me, the revolution is best when demonstrated, and it, it is for many satellites. Great. Thanks very much, Natalie. Really good. Thank you.